All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, I know with our School A Academy lecture hall, we certainly get a mixed audience of um, our school community, our parents. So we welcome you and we're so grateful to have you. Um, and we have students that join us as well. But then we also have educators um, and grandparents and um, other heads of schools that join us and certainly um, stakeholders really across many groups that are involved in the revival of classical Christian education, those that come from uh, Mr. Gibbs circle, and then anyone really who um, has come across the work of Dr. Christopher Perrin, Classical Academic Press, and then School A Academy. So welcome everyone. And I see people are still coming in, which is great. We have um, well over 300 attendees that are registered for tonight. So we're grateful for uh, that attention and that time. Um, just a little bit about tonight's agenda. I'm going to introduce myself, uh, Joanne Shinstock, the Director and Principal of School A Academy. We have Allison Haley, who is our Culture and Events Coordinator. She's behind the scenes helping, making sure this is a great event. Um, and then, of course, the man who everyone came to see, uh, Mr. Gibbs. And so uh, in just a minute, I'm going to introduce him. But uh, briefly, I wanted to talk a little bit about School A Academy and then our mission and vision for the School A Academy lecture hall. So um, if you're new to School A Academy for the first time and you've just come to us uh, learning about the lecture hall, um, you're probably a fan and follower of Mr. Gibbs and that's brought you here tonight. So School A Academy is an educational service line within Classical Academic Press. The school was started in 2014. We offer restful classical Christian education that's personal for um, homeschooling students and um, traditional school students through our tutoring center as well. So we serve um, many families, over 1,700 students in North America and um, abroad. And so with that, a couple years ago, Jolie Hodge, the director at the time, started School A Academy Lecture Hall. And our hopes there is to continue to um, be a part of the conversation when it comes to the revival of classical Christian education, to provide um, support and formation for our parents and our stakeholders as you are involved in the revival of classical Christian education. So much like we try to provide our students a place in the class for contemplative learning, for rich discussion, uh, for exposure to wonderful texts um, and ideas regarding classical Christian education. That's what we hope um, and what we envision for the School A Academy Lecture Hall. So without further ado, let me introduce Mr. Gibbs. Uh, he teaches classic literature to children and adults and offers consulting through gibbsclassical.com. He writes for Circe Institute blog, The Cedar Room. Many of you might be familiar, I'm sure, with his work through Circe, his long running column on pedagogy, parenting, classical literature. He's the creator of the weekly proverbial podcast, which I personally love. And I know a lot of, of our team members, we frequently talk about episodes in our team meeting. Um, and then, of course, his uh, work on classical literature. He's the creator of, um, or I should say, the author of several books, Something They Will Not Forget. And tonight, the forthcoming book that he's going to be reading from and referencing is Love What Lasts. So, um, Mr. Gibbs, thank you for joining us. We are so excited to have you. And with that, I'm going to mute my microphone because everyone is here to listen to you and learn from you. Right. Thank you very much for that introduction. Yes, I'm here to read the first chapter of my next book, Love What Lasts, and I have uh, the advanced reader copy uh, in hand. I had hoped that the book would be available for pre-order at the time that I was um, doing tonight's event, but it's probably going to be another six weeks before the pre-order starts. Um, so I'll send a notice out through my mailing list and put something up on my blog when the book is available. Um, don't worry, it won't uh, it won't go past you. Um, 
The first chapter of the book I'm going to read is on film. And uh, I don't want to create a false impression of Love What Lasts. It's not a book about film. Uh, it's about a number of different subjects. Uh, but for reasons which I'll get into as I read the first chapter, film was a convenient place uh, to begin a discussion about taste and how we decide what we'll watch and how we decide what we'll read and where and listen to and even what we'll eat. Um, so that said, the, the first chapter that I'm about to read is going to propose some uh, dramatic questions and begin to answer them, but not answer them in full. So if you, uh, if by the end of the by the end of the reading, you have more questions than you do now. Um, that's only to be expected, and uh, I hope you'll buy the book and uh, enjoy it when it comes out. But that said, the first chapter, each chapter of the book begins with a quotation, and the first chapter is called On Film. And it begins with a quote which is commonly attributed to H.L. Mencken, and that's, nobody ever went broke underestimating the taste of the American public. Why do Christians love movies so much? I've begun this book with a question which is overly narrow and far too specific, for it's not my intention to write a book about movies or Christians. Movies and Christians will come into the picture, of course, but I want to write about literature, music, fashion, cuisine, sexuality, the past, the future, ephemerality, ugliness, transcendence, and beauty. I want to discuss the omnipresence of mediocrity in American culture and the bizarre course by which Christians have developed both an insatiable hunger for mediocrity and a pathetic theological defense of that hunger. Finally, I want to defend common things, average things, and normal things and show how the desire to have a special marriage, special children, and a special church leads to an unstable and meaningless life. And yet there's no better place to begin such contemplation than the question of why Christians love movies so much. On the one hand, Christians love movies because everyone loves movies, and Christians are not all that different from secularists, agnostics, atheists, or the growing ranks of people who claim to have no religion at all. Christians love movies because movies are entertaining, amusing, alluring, funny, and exciting. Most Americans watch thousands of hours of television and film every year, which means it's easy talking with friends or strangers about what they've seen lately, whether they liked it, and why. Many people feel they can express their beliefs and priorities and tastes by talking about what movies and television shows they find good or bad. To learn that a certain person at a party attends a Lutheran church is not to learn much about it. However, if that man says, I believe that Ordinary People is the best film ever made, he likely feels he has revealed something very significant about himself. And he may even believe that his confession entitles him to learn something significant about everyone else. At the same time, Christians love movies for reasons that are not shared by secularists, agnostics, atheists, and so forth. Christians think of film as an important part of cultural engagement, which means they not only like to watch movies and talk about them, but analyze and interpret movies deeply celebrating certain films for having subtly Christian themes or condemning others for having anti-Christian messages. Christians like to have something to say about movies that everyone is talking about. Discussing the hidden themes and symbolic meanings in movies makes Christians feel as though they are informed members of society who keep abreast of important things. Of course, watching movies is an easy and pleasant way of keeping abreast of things. The Christian who wants to keep his finger on the pulse of society is far more likely to do so by seeing the most popular film in the country than listening to the most popular record in the country or reading the most popular novel. Watching a popular movie is a bit like watching the news. 
The news is the news, no matter how sensational, banal, or awful it is. And if the news happens to contain scandalous stories about the sexual foibles of some politician, Christians do not feel guilty or ashamed to follow such stories, for they feel the need to stay informed. In fact, a man has a certain responsibility to watch the news from time to time. In the same way a man ought to know what his children have been up to lately, he ought to know what the president, the Senate, the House of Representatives, powerful corporate executives, and influential celebrities have been up to lately as well. Within the last generation, cultural engagement has become a popular theological concept that has greatly changed Christian taste in film. The term cultural engagement is relatively new, very fashionable, and thus obviously bound for the slag heap of history. So in the event, uh, so in the event some reader of the future has taken up this book, thumbed through the first several page and wondered what the expression means, I should say that cultural engagement was a theological trend of the early 21st century, wherein Christians supposed that the real heart of evangelism lay in having both up-to-minute knowledge of secular culture and dazzling insights into it. Secular culture was thought to be its own language, and in order to share the gospel, Christians had to speak secular culture fluently. In the same way that residents admire tourists who have learned a little of their native tongue, so too unbelievers would be impressed by the humility of Christians who could, say, bring to light the cryptic hunger for God buried in the latest blockbuster. St. Paul said he would become all things to all men, thus in order to reach a generation obsessed with pornographic music and vapid billion-dollar CGI spectacles, Christian obsessions would have to follow suit. Thus, Christians tend to believe that watching a movie is justifiable if they have something interesting to say about it afterwards. The more lurid the movie, the more profound their analysis must be. Accordingly, a film or television program with grotesque violence and explicit sex must have truly profound gospel themes, although mindless children shows are vindicated merely because they offer simple moral lessons. Many Christians are content to reduce a film to its worldview or to its essential presuppositions. Depending on the plot, the volume of objectionable content, and whether the narrative seems to condemn or condone adultery and theft, and so forth, a film might be deemed secularist or nihilist, existentialist, postmodern, pagan, or what have you. The student learning to analyze worldviews looks first to reduce a work of art to a series of philosophical commitments. Then those commitments are judged against a series of biblical truths. And if the art is consistent with biblical truths, the art is sound. If there is radical inconsistency, the art is unsound. Any worldview other than the Christian worldview is wrong, but provided the viewer correctly diagnoses the intellectual illness of the film, the film poses little problem for the viewer. While worldview analysts tend to find most films problematic, from time to time, a film unwittingly borrows from the Christian worldview and offers something redemptive. If the hero risks his life with his arms outstretched, he can be viewed as a Christ figure. Or if a character undergoes a change of heart shortly after getting a barrel of water dumped on his head, the water might be viewed as a kind of baptism, and the film might have gospel themes. While some Christians still prefer worldview analysis as a cultural hermeneutic, Worldview analysis has largely been replaced by cultural engagement. With the ascendance of emergent Christianity in the years following the World Trade Center attacks, worldview reductionism fell out of fashion, and young Christian essayists and bloggers adopted a softer approach to analyzing secular films. Worldview analysis came to be seen as nitpicky, strict, overly intellectual, and overly critical. The worldview analyst wanted to build a hedge of protection around his heart, which could keep the world out. But emergent Christians fancied themselves bridge builders and accordingly styled their approach to secular culture as one of deference, sympathy, and respect. Emergent Christians went so far as to pride themselves on the familiarity and kinship they felt toward the world, even going so far as to claim the world's complaints with Christianity were an essential aspect of Christianity itself. Whereas the worldview analyst begrudgingly, occasionally admitted Christ figures and gospel themes, sympathetic Christian viewers saw gospel hunger everywhere. 
While worldview analysts were quick to condemn human perversity, the children of worldview analysts saw perverse characters as evidence of human need for the gospel. The more perverse, the more clearly our need for the gospel was depicted. Emergent Christians came and went, but their romantic view of brokenness remains to this day. And the emergent definition of cultural engagement became diffuse in American Christianity. The worldview analyst's tendency to condemn human perversity did not coincide with a reluctance to look at human perversity, though. Worldview analysts were as likely as their emergent children, which we could call uh, sympathists, to watch violent, sexually explicit films, though the former condemned the worldview behind guts and nipples, and the latter exonerated the nipples and guts as a desperate grasping for God, as St. Paul put it while on Mars Hill. But the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. In fact, the worldview analyst and his sympathist son are separated by only a few inches of orchard, for both believe that secular culture warrants a response, and both believe their own responses to secular culture are an essential part of the so-called Great Commission. The worldview analyst believes his dismantling of secular culture will wow the heathen, and the sympathist believes his friendly appreciative response to pop music and blockbuster films will prove an educated diplomatic invitation to secularists. Both think themselves intellectually superior to the films they view, although this prejudice is somewhat justified by the fact that neither viewer has particularly high standards for viewing a film. Both think there is some intellectual benefit to the viewer in spending time on mediocrity. The most important thing worldview analysts and sympathists share in common, though, is the absolutely indiscriminate way in which they choose what to watch. And they share this sad trait in common with nearly all modern men. The way modern viewers choose what to watch has profoundly changed what they watch. In ancient Greece, the annual festival of Dionysius provided men with their only opportunity to see a story performed by actors in a theater. The same was largely true for a thousand years after. Then came the Middle Ages when there were very few operational theaters and became true again after the Reformation began and the dramatic play became a socially accepted art form once more. In the early 20th century, moviegoers might enjoy the luxury of choosing between half a dozen motion pictures every weekend. With the popularization of VHS technology in the 80s, moviegoers could choose between hundreds of films at a video store. And with the advent of streaming technology, viewers could choose between tens of thousands of movies whenever they liked. As a teenager, I recall indecisively pacing around a video store for an hour on a Friday afternoon, looking for something which struck me as sufficient entertainment for the evening. However, once I decided on a particular title, paid for it, and took it home, I was more or less stuck with it until the following day. When I was a child, it was only with extreme reluctance that my family ever turned off a rented video. Although I cannot recall anyone leaving the house at nine o'clock to get something else from the video store. Turning off a movie thus meant the evening's entertainment ended early. And so renting a video from a store had a way of securing one's fate for the night. Anyone who rented a video was stuck with it, committed to it, and far more willing to watch a movie through to the end simply because there was no alternative. On the other hand, the era of streaming means most viewers have no real commitment to the movies they begin watching, which is one of many reasons people now have such a hard time deciding what to watch. Anything we choose to begin watching can be unchosen five minutes later, at which point the selection process starts all over. It's hard to choose when choosing is a meaningless act. It's hard to commit to a film when the commitment can be easily, painlessly broken. In the 1980s, video stores maintained half a dozen different sections devoted to a handful of genres, like drama, and comedy, and action. But streaming services are capable of cataloging films down to very fine nuances of plot. Netflix employs 15 different kinds of thrillers, for instance, like steamy thrillers and international thrillers. Additionally, the streaming service lists more than a dozen different action genres, two dozen sci-fi genres, 
and three dozen different kinds of comedies. The proliferation of genres has kept pace with the proliferation of titles. Just before the demise of video stores, the average blockbuster stocked around 7,000 titles, with more than 10 times that number are available on Amazon. As opposed to giving people exactly what they want, the proliferation of options has proven disorient. The average American now spends more than 100 hours every year just browsing Netflix titles. The problem is not just the staggering number of, number of titles to choose from, but that we have become far harder to please. When my children tell me they are hungry, I tell them they can have an apple. When they tell me they don't want an apple, I say, then you're not feeling hungry, you're feeling picky. Given the profound specificity now possible in classifying movies, we scroll through endless menus under the delusion that a film which perfectly suits our mood is possible. We do not want to watch something good, but something that flatters our feelings and our tastes. The rather simple thesis of this book came to me several years ago while sitting in a movie theater, waiting for Jurassic World Fallen Kingdom to begin. It was a summer's day. When I bought my ticket, I saw that a film entitled First Reformed was playing as well. Several friends had told me that First Reformed was a remarkable film, worth seeing, very moving. But I purchased a ticket for a dinosaur movie instead. As I waited for Jurassic World to begin, I tried to imagine how I would explain to a stranger why I had not purchased a ticket for First Reformed instead. I didn't expect Jurassic World to be any good. I figured that I would walk out of the theater and never give the story a second thought. The film would, I suspected, not offer anything thoughtful or even vaguely philosophical to mull over. I would not need more than 30 seconds to discuss the film with a friend. Rather, I imagined summarizing my feelings about the film with either, eh, it was better than I thought it would be, or wasn't very good. And then moving on to some more interesting subject. On the other hand, I knew that First Reformed would probably be the kind of movie that deserved a second viewing. I knew it was the kind of film I could discuss at length with my friends. However, the choice wasn't really between Jurassic World and First Reformed. The choice was between Jurassic World and every classic film I haven't seen. A ticket to Jurassic World cost $10, but I might have checked Cinema Paradiso out from the library for free. I've never seen Cinema Paradiso, but I've heard it's quite good. I've never seen The Searchers either, or The Passion of Joan of Arc, Battleship Potemkin, Late Spring, Seven Samurai, Persona, or Bicycle Thieves. Some people do not respect film as an art form. I do, and I believe that watching a good film can help a man's soul move nearer to God. My sanity has been restored many times by great films. Nonetheless, I purchased a ticket for Jurassic World. Having considered the possibility of watching Late Spring or Bicycle Thieves or First Reformed, which could have brought me nearer to God, I decided to do what was easier. I chose a film that would overwhelm my senses and starve my intellect. It is a choice that I have made many, many times. As a high school teacher, I have heard both teenagers and adults make the case for blockbuster films. The case the adult makes is nearly indistinguishable, indistinguishable from that of the high school student, a fact that ought to make the teenager suspicious and the adult blush. The case for blockbusters largely consists of two entirely incompatible theses. The first thesis is that blockbuster films are not nourishing, but neither is candy, and while no one can live on candy, no sane person would try. The second thesis is that blockbuster films are actually far more sophist sophisticated than they appear on the surface. If blockbusters were actually like candy, nothing more than a diversion, a lark, a trifle, then only a crank would complain about them. However, our society does not treat blockbusters as mere diversions. A kid in a pizza parlor waiting for a takeout might pass the time by putting a few quarters in a Pac-Man arcade. 
that's a diversion. If a man watches 20 minutes of Die Hard on a hotel TV while his wife gets dressed for the evening, that's a diversion. And yet the release of a blockbuster film is a global event, like a visit from the Pope or the assassination of a European Archduke. With the budget of Avengers Infinity War, a sovereign nation might have purchased two Iowa-class battleships, half a dozen F-16s, 10 Abrams tanks, and several hundred Hellfire rockets, all of which is nearly sufficient for an actual war. While no blockbuster film actually lingers very long in the American imagination, the adoration of blockbuster films has become one of the chief cultural heirlooms this generation is passing on to the next. It wasn't always this way. The highest grossing film of 1979 was Kramer versus Kramer, a PG rated drama about the way the ways a couple's divorce changes them and harms their young son. The film was made for $8 million. It grossed $106 million. It won five Academy Awards, including Best Picture and Best Director. On the other hand, Green Book won Best Picture in 2018 and was the 36th highest grossing film of that year. In 2017, The Shape of Water won Best Picture and was the 46th highest grossing film of the year. In 2016, Moonlight won Best Picture and was the 92nd highest grossing film of the year. Simply put, Americans are no longer very interested in films declared to be the best. 1988 was the last year the highest grossing film of the year had no special effects. Spectacles have quickly come to dominate our taste. At the same time, the highest grossing film of the year tends to have a very short life. Of the top 25 highest grossing films of all time, 16 were released in just the last five years. Obtaining a spot near the top is now relatively easy. Maintaining a spot on the list is difficult. A culture which is based on pure appetite will create an endless supply of products that are staggeringly, profoundly popular, but only for a little while. Following the COVID-19 pandemic, it may be that theaters never recover the popularity they had beforehand, and yet the appeal to profound popularity will continue with films released directly into homes. During the pandemic, news of box office records was quickly replaced by news of streaming records. The second thesis often used to defend blockbusters is that they're actually more sophisticated than they appear. While this thesis is at odds with the first, which contends that blockbusters' lack of sophistication is not really a problem, it is the more common of the two and the more widely accepted. Comic book films now receive scholarly attention, long and nuanced reviews, and the same degree of critical scrutiny formally reserved for films marketed to honest-to-God adults. It is not uncommon or considered strange for a review of Deadpool or Batman to discuss what the film has to say about America's international policy, universal health care, capitalism, climate change, race, gender, or a dozen other issues about which the director has no competence to speak. At the same time, it is perfectly understandable that the filmmakers would feel compelled to say something about important matters. After all, many blockbusters now cost hundreds of millions of dollars to make, rake in over a billion dollars, and bring more people to theaters in a month than will go to church during that time. Little nods to significant issues add the illusion of profundity and make moviegoers feel as though they're not wasting their time. What is more, reviews of comic book films often invoke fashionable, unreadable modern philosophers like Derrida, Hegel, and Foucault which flatters viewers into thinking that a refined intellect is necessary in order to understand what is nothing more than a gazillion dollar special effects bonanza. The average Avengers viewer has never read Foucault though, which means the blockbuster also needs a few easy things in art times. And so the final act of a blockbuster usually centers on sacrifice or teamwork. Teamwork if it's an ensemble piece, sacrifice if it's a one man show. Granted, many of the critics who treat blockbuster films as compelling, rewarding works of art are well-read, thoughtful individuals, and so dismissing all those critics, all their reviews, and every blockbuster film ever made would be immodest and irresponsible. 
Nonetheless, I would point out that blockbuster films are now quite common, as are glowing reviews of blockbusters. And that if half these films were as good as anyone claims, we could expect them to linger in the cultural imagination for some time. But they don't. Our interest in blockbusters swells suddenly and dies down as suddenly as it came. It's a Wonderful Life barely broke even at the box office. But because that film is so good, 75 years later, it still plays in theaters all over the world every December. Blockbuster films, on the other hand, enjoy a three-month theatrical run, sell wildly when they become available for home viewing, but more or less disappear by the end of the following year. For the moment, my contention's a rather simple one. If these films were actually good, they would last quite a bit longer. The fact that lately released films pass through our cultural digestive system so quickly means that no one who writes about them has had much time to think about them. While the critic who references Foucault in his review of the latest Marvel film sounds quite impressive, his opinions of his subject have nevertheless been formulated quickly. Social media incentivizes hasty reactions, not opinions which are the result of multiple viewings, numerous conversations with friends, and slow ruminations. Because Christian worldview analysts and sympathists alike see film as an opportunity for cultural engagement, the rapidity with which entertainment is devoured is now thought problematic. The worldview analyst can dismantle a film by revealing the philosophical incoherence of the plot and themes, then demonstrate all the ways a biblical worldview offers unshakable answers to questions which secular filmmakers can only guess at. Meanwhile, the sympathist reduces a film to a series of unwitting references to the gospel and unfulfilled longings, which only Christ can satisfy. No film viewing is complete without identifying these references and longings. And both believe a film viewing is not complete until all the philosophical faults have been recognized and all the theological inconsistencies called out. Either way, most Christians regard movies as invitations to talk. I'm being critical, but despite the derogatory way in which I have characterized both kinds of viewers, I believe that the worldview analyst and the sympathist separately understand something vital about the role of the viewer. Yet both also fail to get to the heart of the matter. The worldview analyst's blithe condemnation of movies is often justified, but most movies are not worth watching in the first place, and watching films one suspects are worth unworthy is foolish, pretentious, and slothful. The sympathist rightly understands that some films deserve the benefit of the doubt, but he gives this benefit in a recklessly profligate manner. Both lack a sound rationale for choosing what to watch. And I write this as someone who thought himself a competent worldview analyst for many years, then thought himself a daring sympathist for many years, and then slowly discovered by teaching classic literature that neither position held much water. Having grown up in a reformed community during the 1990s, I was fully trained in the art of worldview analysis by the time I began college. During college, however, like most young Christians, I turned against many of the precepts upon which I had been raised and fell in with the fashionable philosophies of the day. I was entranced by the emergent church and made several pilgrimages to Seattle, where I attended Mars Hill services, listened with rapture to sermons wherein biblical principles were illustrated with ideas borrowed from secular music and films, observed fashionable band po posters, which inexplicably hung in the narthex of the church building and suddenly felt that my years of devotion to popular culture had not been wasted. I started a blog and spent my early 20s arguing that violent movies and rock music could be spiritually illuminating if one only had eyes to see. At the time I began arguing that violent movies and rock music were actually profound, I'm not sure I had read any old books from front to back. I had attended a classical high school where I had prided myself on my ability to write convincing essays on books I had skimmed. In my defense, and this is not much of a defense, I'll admit, worldview analysis does not really reward the time and work it takes to do a close read. So I never felt all that guilty for blowing through a thousand lines of Homer in three minutes. I was able to draw the proper conclusions, and within a community which thought worldview analysis a strong hermeneutical strategy, the proper conclusions were often good enough for a passing grade. 
When I played the part of the sympathist and wrote impassioned essays advocating for violent films and rock music, I found that the same spacious lines of reason with which I had learned to condemn a film's worldview could just as easily be used to exonerate it. It was not until I began my career as a classic literature teacher that I understood the place of the audience and that great works of art invite us to listen, not to talk. At the beginning of my career, my objection to worldview analysis was that it put the audience in an adversarial relationship with the artifact being analyzed. It often seemed the worldview analyst would do just as well spending five minutes reading a synopsis of a film as spending two hours watching it, given the narrow range of qualities and plot points the analyst found relevant. Were adulterers punished in the end? Was theft and murder condoned? Were sinners unhappy? Did the righteous receive justice? Do women push men around? Most of the worldview analysts' tasks rest on getting simple objective answers to questions like these all of which can be answered with a quick Google search. As my career as a classical teacher was beginning, I became the editor of a film review site called Film Fisher. In the three years Film Fisher was up, and first three years that Film Fisher was up and running, I wrote nearly a hundred film reviews. Very quickly, I discovered that reviews of new films needed to be published within several days of their release. New films that were not reviewed until two or three weeks after their release date would attract little or no readership. Consequently, I would often attend a film on opening night, begin writing the review directly after, finish the review on Saturday afternoon, and publish it on Saturday evening or Sunday morning. Many of these reviews were little more than exercises in style. As opposed to deciding how to say what I believe true of a film, I often wrote reviews while still deciding what was true. Eventually, the turnaround time between viewing a film and writing the review seemed to me so brief, I often began composing a review in my head before the film was even over, which turned moviegoing into a chore. In the first few years I wrote for Film Fisher, I believed a position of lenience and generosity toward a work of art was necessary in order to truly understand it. However, while I was writing generous film reviews, I was also teaching Dante and Jane Austen. And eventually, I came to the rather obvious conclusion that it was unreasonable to grant the same hearing to Transformers 3 that I offered to the Divine Comedy. Some art warrants a generous audience, and some art does not. A book which has survived a seven-century-long vetting process and boasts universal acclaim cannot be evaluated on the same terms as a blockbuster film, wherein a lingerie model doubles as an actress and alien robots destroy a major US city. It is foolish to interpret ephemeral and sensual amusements in the same teachable, receptive frame of mind that deathless works of art deserve. At the same time, the worldview analyst usually addresses himself to a film or book as the one who must be pleased. But it's arrogant to uncritically dismiss the countless and varied audiences that have for many hundreds of years claimed a certain work as beautiful true and humane, and to instead demand a sacrosanct epic poem prove itself anew. When Christians gather to hear a lecture entitled How to Watch a Movie, they often expect to hear about the symbolic value of certain camera angles or the theological underpinnings of a certain lighting technique. In the last year, though, I have delivered a lecture with this very title on two separate occasions, and I open the lecture by saying, I would like to teach you how to watch a movie. The first point I'd like to make is the most important one, really, and it's this. Don't watch a movie. You watch too many movies. This point is not entirely in jest, though people often laugh. The reason the average American spends 100 hours every year scrolling through Netflix menus is that an evening spent in front of the television is now often predicated on the claim, I'm in the mood to watch something. When a man begins scrolling through Netflix screens looking for something, he quickly realizes that he's not actually in the mood to watch something because every screen he passes over contains half a dozen somethings which he could watch. Neither is the man looking for something good to watch because he knows the titles of 50 classic films he has never seen and is not tempted by any of them. There is a 0% chance that someone who begins searching for something to watch will end up sitting through all of Ingmar Bergman's wild strawberries. 
Rather, the man in the mood for something will look for a film which is exciting, sexy, or funny, not something contemplative. He takes up the task of choosing a film with no forethought, no plan, and thus no sense of duty or obligation. By the same token, the man who goes to the cupboard because he wants something to eat will usually end up eating chips. When hungry, no one thinks they ought to eat chips. When we think of what we ought to eat when hungry, we think of fruits and vegetables. And the man who enters the kitchen, having already decided what he will eat, is probably going to have an apple. When a man is at the grocery store and decides to buy a bag of chips, he tells himself, I'll have a few of these with a sandwich or a bowl of soup. He does not plan to eat the entire bag in a single sitting, but he could easily eat the entire bag by walking into the kitchen with no plan, no should, no purpose. Similarly, the man who begins searching for something, be it a film, a snack, or a sexual partner, without first clearly defining what standards will guide his search, usually ends up deciding with his stomach, not his mind or heart. I'll return to this point at the close of the book, but for now, I'll admit that over the last year, I watched servile trash like Armageddon, Zoolander, and The Hangover, but only after scrolling aimlessly through a thousand other options. These are not films which any dignified adult would make plans to watch many hours in advance, but concessions reluctantly made to an evening which is rapidly disappearing in the mire of indecision. Now, I should clarify that I have begun watching Armageddon, Zoolander, and The Hangover. I rarely finish these movies. Rather, I watch one of these films for about an hour, then quit because it's late. And it's late because I've already spent half an hour just trying to decide what to watch. Having spent the last 15 years teaching at Christian high schools, testimonial evidence suggests that Christians are no better than secularists at choosing what to watch, which means that regardless of the high-minded reasons they give for watching movies, at the end of the day, what most, Christian want, what most Christians want is something pleasurable, something that flatters their senses. Given the extraordinary amount of time that Christians spend watching movies and television, to approach movies and television in an arbitrary fashion, without a plan, without a coherent philosophy, without an eye toward greater maturity and nobility, is to approach a good deal of life as a whole in an arbitrary fashion. While books, lectures, and essays about better time management have become fashionable in an age of endless distraction, simply watching fewer banal movies is not a sufficient plan. The man who watches one banal movie has little reason not to watch another, for he has already proven to himself that his time is worth very little. It's possible for a man to manage his time evenly, spending too much time on any one thing, but thoughtfully portioning hours for work, reading, eating, films, music, conversations with friends, and time spent with his family, and for his life to be nonetheless frittered away in trivialities. For the world is inundated with trivial books, stupid music, empty conversations, and shallow people. Many time management experts claim their services can help distracted people accomplish all the things they really want to do. And yet, unless people want good things, Helping them fulfill their desires will only further their destruction. As I stated at the beginning of this chapter, it's not my intention to write a book about movies, but about literature, music, fashion, cuisine, sexuality, the past, the future, ephemerality, ugliness, transcendence, and beauty. I want to talk about taste. My contention is that good things are hard to like, and that good taste is hard to acquire. I have begun a book about acquiring good taste with a series of observations on movies, because Americans spend so much time watching movies and TV shows. The spacious reasons Christians claim to watch movies and the arbitrary, selfish ways in which we choose what to watch have corrupted our taste, for we have an insatiable appetite for things that we know will not last. While bad taste in film is hardly the worst of our problems, it is emblematic of our bad taste in theology, philosophy, morals, ethics, literature, fashion, music. Bad taste is cancerous and is rarely contained in a single organ. And good taste is like yeast, for it also tends to spread. I am not suggesting that anyone should begin rebuilding his tastes, his loves, affinities, and prejudices around movies but rather that the mainstream of American culture is hell-bent on mediocrity. 
and that unless a man makes a conscious effort to swim against the current, he will unintentionally squander his life. Unexamined tastes are not worth satisfying. Thank you. Thank you very much. There's so much here for us to think about. Um, I know as a mother, I have lots of questions and thoughts running through my mind. Um, we have some questions that have already come in and um, I encourage everyone to continue to put some questions there. There's um, a first question I thought I would put out to you because it, I think it's a good segue from actually where you just finished the lecture. Um, you're talking about in the end there um, that you say, unless a man makes a conscious effort to swim against the current, right, to turn away from mediocrity. And so one of our questions here is, do you think our attendance of films being greater than our church attendance is a symptom of failure in culture, church, both, or something else? Oh, man. Um, <laughs> um, well, it's... We could probably pin responsibility for it on churches a long time ago that's kind of gradually played out and filtered out into society at large. Um, I, I do think that there are I do think that there are tendencies in our culture which are so massive that they're really hard to see and that those currents have really been flowing very hard for several hundred years now. Mm. So the, the, the argument in Love What Lasts is that there's a significant change uh, in Western culture at the time of the French Revolution, which uh, when finally played out in the early part of the 20th century, creates popular culture as we know it today. Uh, and that popular culture tends toward banalities uh, whereas localized culture does not, um, or, or patronized culture doesn't, and localized culture doesn't. Um, and so I think that there are, there are certain responsibilities that I think the church bears. Um, so many churches now model themselves after secular culture and do so proudly, uh, and they do so in the name of building bridges. Um, but I, I think that most of the bridges that contemporary churches uh, believe that they have built for people to get in by but are actually being used for people to get out by. Um, every bridge goes two ways. Um, and having built so many bridges to secular culture, it's not surprising that church attendance is declining. All those bridges are just being used in the wrong way. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, I, I, I suppose that that all the all the parties are guilty that were that were named in the question. <laughs> all are punished, as the uh, <laughs> as the cop says at the end of Romeo and Juliet. I think for another night, it would be really interesting to get into a conversation about those bridges. And you commenting goes both ways. Um, but let's look at this other question here. Do you think the low and mediocre taste of our mainstream culture? could be connected to our country's relative youth? In a certain sense, yes. Um, I don't think that, uh, I don't think that mediocre culture is a, is a uniquely American problem. Um, although America's greatest and most vital export is culture. Um, uh, it, it's American culture that has become super popular all over the world. Um, it's not uh, it's not African, it's not Chinese, it's not Spanish, it's not Italian culture as a whole that's that's dominating uh, America. It's Americans that keep foisting um, you know Taylor Swift and and Drake on the rest of the world uh, who are helplessly saying like stop, stop sending us this stuff. Well the same ones are um, so I I think that uh, America might be more responsible for putting out um, ephemeral garbage culture in the world than others, but but others are certainly buying it. I mean, there uh, 
our our lousy films are popular the world over our lousy singers are popular the world over um it could be the youth of our country um and there might be uh i know that in the you know in the earliest days of american history america was sort of the was sort of the T.J. Maxx of Great Britain. Uh, Great Britain would send all of their uh, also ran uh, clothing and and the unpopular stuff that they couldn't sell over to America, and Americans just gobbled up all of the uh, um, all of the ugly stuff that Europeans wouldn't be content with. Um, I don't know that I don't know that great culture is going to flourish in a society which is as egalitarian as ours. So as, a, as opposed to our youth, I would I would tend to think that it has more to do with our egalitarian ways, mm -hmm. uh, whereas societies that acknowledge that um, that a social, a social or cultural hierarchy can be beneficial uh, are also more likely to create things that um, that are properly called high culture. What you're saying also makes, and this is obviously not a, a, a thought that I've had that I've <laughs> spent a lot of time, but just in direct response right now to what you're saying, it makes me wonder, because there's the argument that, you know, the breakdown from the greatest generation to the baby boomers, and then the baby boomers are, you know, my parents' generation. And I look at myself, and I suppose even what we call the millennials have this return to, or this um desire to return to the traditional ways or or the um the old road if you will whether that's in the church or right. even the revival of classical christian education so i was just thinking about that i'm i'm wondering if again the breakdown maybe of what some argue happened between the greatest generation and their children the baby boomers how that feeds into kind of what you were saying with um the egalitarian ways. I'm just wondering kind of the, the loss of piety um, in terms of respect for, for elders and how that might play out. I, that strikes me as a, um, as a sort of uh, reliable, like an historically reliable, repeatable sort of, sort of observation. Um, because e even ancient uh, ancient Greeks were observing, um, like our grandfathers were real men, our fathers were kind of men, and we're a bunch of, um, you know, beardless babies. Uh, that's a that's a sentiment that that our grandparents actually knew what was up. Uh, that's that's rather ancient, and I don't think that means that it's wrong. I simply think that that it's um, that while it's a fair observation, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't mean that we uh, we have to look at the problem as so recent as it as it might appear. Um, so I I think that they're based on the way that technology develops and based on the way that history moves. Um, there is something there is something about our grandparents uh, that will always intimidate us in terms of self reliance. Um, grandchildren are never as self reliant as their grandparents. Uh, and I think that's probably true in, at, at almost any year in history that you might that you might select. Um, and of course, our grandparents probably don't look terribly self-sufficient to our great great grandparents, um, given all of the advantages that our grandparents had. Um, so I, I don't know that it's. Uh, I think that there's something distinct about the 20th century in the way of you know, the advent of popular culture that begins changing everything. Um, but, I, but I don't know that this is about a, a particular breakdown between like the 40s and the, and the 60s. I, I, at least I, I would need to see a, maybe a more compelling case made that that, that was it um, yeah, for what that's worth. Thank you. Um, this is an anonymous question. I have lost my taste for almost any show, television or film in the past few years. I don't know why. Did you notice any change in your appetite for watching something, in, in quotes there, during or after writing this book? Well, I simply I simply started noticing how big of a problem I had when choosing what I watch. Um, because I don't, I don't set myself up in this book as somebody who has arrived. 
like almost all of the problems that I identify, I identify through self-reflection. Um, so when, I mean, when I talk about, you know, spending hours scrolling around for something to watch, I'm not talking about like people out there have this problem that, that I have conquered. Um, I, I have all the problems that, that average people have. So if average people have a problem of scrolling forever through Netflix, I mean, I got to assume that I have that problem too. Um, having written the book, I just notice it a whole lot more and it, and it bothers me. And in as much as it bothers me, you know, I've attempted to do something about it. Um, but it's, but it's an uphill struggle. Um, I, I don't have great taste. I, I wish I did. I know what good taste is. Um, but I am struggling to have good taste. Um, and there's, you know, there's something in the book, especially in the final chapter, where I propose my own uh, or describe my own efforts um, at, at, at developing better taste. Um, but, but I don't look at myself as somebody who has arrived at all. Um, yeah, I, and I say that lest, uh, you know, somebody follow me on Spotify or come over to my house and look at my record collection. Uh, <laughs> I find, you know, Prince there and be like, hey, you wrote that book about old stuff. What's this doing here? I, I make no claims at having arrived. Um, I have given up, I, I guess I would say, I have given up the certain pretenses I used to have that, that Prince is like secretly profound. Like, I don't think that he's secretly profound. Um, and, and I um, and also, as I, as I sort of lay forth in the book, um, I think that a lot of Christians have this very, this very binary way of, looking at what's allowable and what's not allowable in terms of um, in terms of films and music and culture and this kind of thing. And uh, and one of the one of the reasons why we have a very binary view of it is because back in the 1970s and 80s and maybe for the early part of the 90s, um, the secularists that Christians were arguing against were very relativistic. Uh, and they would they would make claims about, well, this is okay for me to watch. I I don't mind this sort of film. If you don't like it, then you shouldn't watch it, but it's okay for me. And Christians responded by, um, by arguing that, well, there's, there's no middle ground. This is not, a, you know, this is not an issue where what's right to watch is relative uh, to you and that you can, it can be right for you to watch it and wrong for me to, you know, wrong for me to watch it. There is an absolute standard here and all things are either good or bad. All things are either righteous or unrighteous. Uh, there's, no neutral, uh, there's no neutrality. Um, and I, I don't think that that's a biblical approach. I don't think that that's what scripture teaches. Um, and there's a, uh, I forget which chapter it is in the book, but um, St. Paul says that there are things that are allowable that are not profitable. Um, it, which most Christians, at least back in the 80s and 90s, didn't have any category for. What do you mean allowable but not profitable? No, there's either things that you can watch or things that you can't. Uh, and the idea that there could be something that you could watch um, that wasn't wrong to watch but wasn't right to watch either. Like Christians would freak out and they'd be like, no, that's neutrality. Nothing's, there's no neutrality. Um, but I think that... Uh, St. Paul's teaching that there are things that are allowable but not profitable uh, allows for a very real sort of common sense to come back into the way that we decide what we're going to watch. Um, and I, I'm not going to tell anyone that Transformers 3 is a sin to watch, uh, but you're out of your mind if you think it's a profitable movie to watch. Um, so it's not a sin necessarily to watch Transformers 3. And it's not necessarily a sin to watch Terrence Malick's Tree of Life. But to say that these two films have the same moral quality or the same moral effect on viewers simply because they're both allowable to watch is absurd. Uh, and so I, I think that Christians need to, um, need to retain this, this Pauline possibility of things being allowable but not profitable. And I think that the way that you, you evaluate what you listen to, what you watch, it's just transformed as soon as you as soon as you allow for this sort of common sense middle uh, between things that you absolutely cannot watch and things that you can or should. We have a lot of questions. I, I think that kind of 
move into that, you know, should we allow teens to watch this or that? Um, so one of the questions, um, maybe just to dive a little bit deeper into this, um, do you see the luminous production of banal entertainment today as a continuation from previous eras? Then there's examples like Victorian penny dreadfuls or ancient Roman gladiator fights right. as an acceleration of pre-existing trends or as something altogether distinct. I would say that it's distinct and I, I, I sort of want to, at least in the book, I argue that it begins with certain philosophical convictions um, that emerge around the late 18th century, but which take uh, around a hundred years to come to fruition. So there are ideas about art that emerge with the, with the French Revolution and the revolt against aristocracy and a kind of um, uh, enforced egalitarianism that, that begins with the French Revolution. But I think that those ideas uh, take a long time to actually manifest themselves in an easily visible sort of way. I think that the egalitarianism of the French Revolution is sort of actuated with the advent of popular culture at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, and and when, I, when I say the advent of popular culture, I'm, I'm willing, uh, I'm really referring here to transistor radio, light bulb, and automobile. Uh, the convergence of those three things create popular culture. Um, the, the radio means that there's really no such thing as just local music anymore. Um, now, all of a sudden, the entire country is a potential customer. Um, I think that the commodification of art is also important in the creation of popular culture. Um, and when I say the commodification of it, I mean uh, going from a society where if you wanted to hear you know, Beethoven, you had to go hear someone play it um, to the creation of uh, you know, records uh, where you can listen to it entirely on your own. Um, uh, but, but all of these things kind of in the 20th century, I think are this almost this perfect storm for actuating these more egalitarian ideas about art or these, these kind of anti-clerical, anti-transcendent views of art that, um, that emerge in, in enlightened philosophy. Um, but, but I am looking back at say the last 200 years as a distinct period in history uh, for the creation of mediocre art. Um, and mediocre art, and, and this would be a very, this would be a bit of an, a long explanation, so I'll simply refer you to the book on this. Um, the creation of mediocre art is a phenomenon of the last 2,000 years. I'm not the, I don't mean that the creation of bad art begins in the last uh, 200 years, I'm sorry. Um, but the mediocre art, as as I define it in the book, which is high, which is um, which is art that's meant to have a a massive, immediate, sensual impact on the audience, um, to be enjoyed for a very brief period of time uh, by everyone, and then essentially discarded by everyone. That sort of art has only existed for two hundred years. Um, there's just there's just not a philosophy and a technology that that coalesce to create such things uh, until the last 200 years. Um, because you said in this chapter that, you know, you want to talk about taste um, and not necessarily specifically movies or literature or music that, that in and of itself, um, but there is a question here about taste. You mentioned that we need to go into the kitchen with a specific food in mind or we are likely to eat something non-nutritious. Is this right. principle applicable to all areas of life? If not, which ones? Yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's applicable to to many areas of life. I, I would hesitate to say all. I think that it that applies to um, to almost anything uh, where you're going to have to decide how pleasant you want your life to be that, that, that if you that if there's any decision that you have to make where you're deciding how pleasant you want your life to be if you don't have a plan you're probably going to err on the side of more pleasant not on the side of uh, austerity 
Uh, austerity requires a plan. Um, sensuality is what we kind of default to. Um, so, in, so in any decision where you've got a choice to, to make, uh, where you have to decide between something that is immensely pleasurable, something that's moderately pleasurable, uh, or something that's basically ascetic and good for you, but unpleasant. If you walk into that situation without a plan, you're, you're probably going to choose what's easiest. I know we're coming down to the end of the evening, but we still have some great questions here. So I'd like to throw yeah. a couple more uh, before we close. Um, I notice when I choose something to watch to please my senses, it's when I'm unhappy, angry, or not feeling validated. Mm -hmm. I find myself trying to soothe myself during these emotional lows with dumb movies that I would never choose when I'm feeling happy with myself and life. Do you think our culture is attracted to mediocrity because we are so unhappy with ourselves? Oh, that sounds uh, that sounds like a very fair explanation of it. Um, I had never uh, I had never thought of it in those terms. But that does make a lot of sense. Um, the uh, the one sort of similar example um, that I offer, I think I offer it in the book, is um, uh, what you would like what you would plan on doing doing in the evening. Uh, from the perspective you have of the morning versus what you end up doing in the evening um, uh, if you don't have a plan. So, you know, in the, in the morning, I mean, consider how many people, how many people, uh, you know, wake up, have to wake up at 6.30 um, and they've gotten, you know, way too little sleep and they're disappointed in themselves and they're frustrated when they wake up at 6.30 and they're like, oh, I'm going to bed early tonight. That is what I am doing. I'm gonna have my dinner at seven o'clock. I'm gonna read my book. Uh, I'm gonna watch one episode of Seinfeld and then I'm going to bed at 9.30. Um, and that's that's a reasonable plan to make right there. Um, it, but that's the sort of plan that you make at 6.30 in the morning um, when you've got like a cool nine hours between you and the thing that you're actually gonna do. Um, no one says in the morning, uh, after having gotten no sleep, uh, I'm going to stay up until three in the morning, uh, like researching the Wu-Tang Clan on Wikipedia. Like no one plans on that. That's a thing you fall into if you don't have a plan and don't stick to it. Um, so uh, I don't want to I don't want to come across as a relativist here where like anything you plan is good. But plans are far better than not making plans. Um, and, the, and so so for the person who asked this question, like I entirely agree, um, like you're far more emotional at night than you are in the morning. I, I would wager, I mean, that's, that's true for me. Like when I wake up, um, you know, I may be tired, but I, I, I tend to not wake up angry or sad. Um, if I'm gonna be angry or sad, I'm gonna be angry or sad in the evening. Um, so, I mean, this is why a lot of people are far more productive in the morning than they are in the evening. Um, uh, my father used to say, uh, nothing that you stay awake after midnight to do is worth doing. Um, and, you know, that was the kind of thing that I hated to hear back when I was 19. Um, but if I could take back every sin I've committed between 12 at night and 6 in the morning, uh, I'd be a much better person today. <laughs> like... Uh, I do a lot of my sinning late at night, um, very little of it in the morning. And, and it's often because I'm in a far more emotional, less rational mood at night than the morning. That's an awesome point whoever made that. Well, and I know we're running out of time, but just that question and your response to it also makes me think about, you know, especially with our students, we talk about the cultivation of virtues and just thinking of that example of, okay, at the end of the evening, is it too simple just to say, well, I lack that virtue or that fortitude or that um, diligence, discipline to recognize I have to do something more purposeful or more productive. And I don't mean productive in the sense, um, but worthwhile. or for the soul, worthwhile. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I, I, is that too simple? of a follow-up to that thought of, well, that's what it's coming down to, whether child or adult, we yeah. just lack the virtue. <laughs> yeah, and I, and um, yeah, I made this made this point before in, um, in some articles that I've written for Cersei, 
I think a lot of people stay up so late because they haven't done anything really satisfying with their day. Mm. Um, like, the, like the more satisfying, the, like the harder you work throughout the day, the easier it is to go to bed at 10 o'clock at night, like a reasonable person. Um, but like when I think back uh, to times in my life when I was living like a vampire, staying up till six in the morning and sleeping until two or three in the afternoon, I, I wasn't doing anything profitable. You know, my, my work was not interesting or satisfying. And I and so I stayed up very late hoping that I would I would find something or do something that would that would prove a satisfying end to my day. But I didn't. Um so you know, when I was you know 20 years old working at a pizza restaurant, um, you know, probably watching, I don't know, a hundred and fifty movies a year. Uh, for several years out of, you know, after I dropped out of college. I come, who's who's going to go to sleep after living that kind of day? Um, you haven't done anything that seems to warrant sleep. Why would you conclude the day at 10 o'clock at night when you haven't done anything that's that you can be proud of? Um, and so, I, you know, this is not everybody, granted, but um, I mean, you stay up until, if if you stay, like, try this, you stay up until three in the morning watching worthless television. Note the kind of commercials that play, all right? Um, like I remember, remember back when I was like 22, uh, man, I watched terrible TV shows. And um, I like to watch these, uh, well, I, I think that the, it means something different now than it did back then, but I would watch these dating shows like um, Eliminate, uh, fifth wheel, like it's just trash TV. And it, you know, it played at 1.30 in the morning, um, you know, because they assume that if you're up until 1.30 in the morning watching TV, you have no taste whatsoever. They would never play these shows at like six in the, six in the evening. Um, reasonable people are having dinner at six in the evening. So I watched these shows at 1.30 in the morning and like you notice the commercials that played during these shows. <laughs> the commercials that played are, uh, are you fat? Do you need to lose weight? Um, Taco Bell advertisements, uh, advertisements for dating services, uh, assuming that you're single, um, uh, advertisements for people who have sexually transmitted diseases, like, like drugs for people, um, for people who have STDs. Um, and like, these are basically the only commercials that run uh, at two in the morning when you're watching trash TV. Um, so, so like, uh, you know, follow the capitalist miracle. They're not wasting their money here. If you're up until two in the morning watching TV, they got a pretty good idea what kind of person you are. Um, you need to lose some weight. You smoke. You're lonely. Um, and <laughs> like all that was true. Like, I remember like thinking that one time, like while I was, you know, while I was smoking, watching these TV shows at two in the morning, I'm like, man, they know me well. And I was kind of embarrassed by how well they had pegged me. Like, like, yes, I need to lose some weight. Yes, Taco Bell sounds really good right now. Yes, I am lonely. Um, but like, the, you know, all those commercials, they never play during a reasonable time of, time of day. Um, and I think that there's, there, there's some, just something greedy about people that stay up until three in the morning. Like, you don't need that many hours. You don't, you don't need that much time. Um, you've had enough time. Go to go to bed. Um, but that, but that same sort of impulse, uh, to just accumulate as much as you possibly can, uh, just sort of befit someone who doesn't really have a, a strategy for living. So one last question on taste, um, and thinking about like those shows you mentioned with the trash or, or film yeah. that we say to watch. Uh, final question here. What do you think about the programs that allow one to remove the trash, the language, the sexual content, um, all of that from movies while viewing? What might it do to Christian kids to be given freedom to watch this mediocre, would be inappropriate movie with total freedom uh, and to walk away believing they're now good because those bad things were removed? <laughs> yes. I, you know, I understand um, that the, that the heart of people that come up with services like VidAngel and that kind of thing, I, uh, 
I, I understand that they think that they're offering something valuable. I don't like those services though. Um, and I've, I've written against them many times before. Um, and, and it's not because I love graphic violence and, <laughs> and profanity. Um, it's, it seems that there's something so desperate, um, so clinging about needing to watch movies that are made by people that you don't trust. Uh, and, and that you that you acknowledge to be um, the maker of this film was it was a really vulgar perverse person. I want to watch this anyway. I just want to tailor it to my morality. Um, if you want to watch a good movie, you don't need those services. If you want to watch a good movie, um, you need to you need to watch the movies of Billy Wilder. You need to watch the movies of Frank Capra. Um, you, you don't need someone, uh, you know, to edit out the objectionable parts of Zoolander so that you can watch it with your family. You just need to watch something better. Um, so I, I think that the question is very fair uh, that, we, that we take these just absolutely um, mediocre films, um, you know, run them through a service, pop out, uh, you know, a sex scene and a couple F words, and we're like, now this movie is good. Um, it, it, if you're really reducing movies to their objectionable content, you do not know how to evaluate films in the first place. Um, or, or your taste is just bad. Um, and your, your taste is bad, but your morals are good. But, the, but the, the two issues are somewhat separated. They can't be entirely separated forever. Um, but, but it's possible to be... Uh, I don't know, it's possible to be naive and yet have terrible taste. Um, I mean, like, I, this is a problem that a lot of children have. Um, like, children are relatively pure of heart, at least when they're compared with adults, but children have terrible taste. Like, if you don't govern the taste of a child, they just buy, I mean, I've got two daughters. If you don't constantly tell children no, they just buy sparkly pink crap to wear for their entire lives. Um, and it's not because they're they're morally atrocious human beings. It's just because you can't equate morality and taste. Um, but I do think that services like VidAngel kind of conflate the issue of taste and morality in some, in some dangerous ways, um, which, which I don't think will work in the long run. And I'm really, I'm really scared of those things, those services, because I think that if we're, that if we're taking out, um, I mean, if we're taking out you know, profanity and sex scenes now, I worry that a day will eventually come where you can like create the woke version of a movie or the conservative version of a movie, like with a push of a button. Um, and, and that there'll be some scale, like how woke do you want this movie to be on a one to 10 scale? Uh, and, it, and everything will suit and flatter our preferences, um, you know, down to the nth degree. Um, or that just, these services will start inspiring people to begin pouring over the past and editing out everything in older films that they don't like. Like as soon as we have this sort of itemized view of what movies are, then a movie's not a whole story. Uh, it's true, they do just create more decisions, more to decide on, as though we didn't have enough decisions already. Um, like obviously I don't think that there's anything morally unsound about, I mean, I guess about clicking a button and taking all the F words out of a film. But if that's what it looks like today, you've really got to imagine what it's going to look like 20 years from now. Um, and there's just no way that this doesn't become like this completely customizable future. Um, and, there's a, and there's a lot of people who wouldn't be appropriately challenged by great art if they could simply take all the objectionable stuff out of it. You just end up with like Thomas, Thomas Jefferson's Bible where he removes all the miracles and just makes the rational part and just keeps the rational parts. That's the first vid angel right there. Um, that's like, uh, remove the supernatural superstitious parts of the Bible, click. Uh, now you can get the Bible in, you know, in the regular version or in the new um, updated for science version. Uh, and so I, I think, I, I don't like editing movies. Um, I, <laughs> I don't, I mean, I, if my kids want to look away when, when somebody's about to get stabbed in a Hitchcock film, that's fine. Um, but I really don't like to show them films where I have to fast forward through something. Um, I don't even like, I, don't like, I hate fast forwarding through stuff. Uh, I'm going to watch something. I want to watch it front to back. Um, 
but I don't want to, I don't want to tailor it to my, my preference. I'd rather just watch something that I can trust um, than have to have this like, I don't know, atomized relationship with everything that comes into my house. Thank you. I think that brings us to the end of our evening. And I know, I mean, I've enjoyed this. Um, I see you have an invitation to come to Australia from Father Stephen David. So <laughs> um, maybe that'll come to be. Um, but I, I look forward to reading the rest of this book. And I know, um, as you said, it's coming out mid-January. God so, willing, yes. <laughs> uh, we'll pray for that and, and make sure that that comes to be. Uh, so thank you so much for um, just spending your evening with us, yeah. giving us um, great questions um, and, and thoughts to think about uh, in terms of what it means to cultivate taste and, and why that's so important across tonight. We talked about film, but so many other areas of our life and in the formation of our children, but also certainly the formation of our, our own souls. So, and intellect. So yeah, thank you're you very so welcome. much. Thanks for the invitation. Absolutely. Well, I will give you the uh, final word if there's any last bit of um, wisdom or um, insight that you'd like to leave us with. Yeah. Um, just when it comes to films, I'll, I'll um, tip my uh, tip my hand for for the advice that's given in the in the end of the in the end of Love What Lasts. Um, as often as you can, take recommendations from people that you trust. Uh, let that be the way that you decide what you watch. Um, uh, find critics that you trust. Find friends that you trust. Ask them what's good, uh, and 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 trust them. Um, don't entrust yourself to what Netflix thinks that you want to watch or ought to watch. Um, but get recommendations from people you trust and and start there. Thank you so much. And I'm going to put in our chat box. Um, this is a link that was on our events page if you want to get in touch with Mr. Gibbs and invite him to Australia or, or your hometown or wherever you are and certainly continue the conversation with him. Um, that link is there and it's also on our events page. And if you have any questions about tonight's event or getting a copy, um, a, a link to the recording, you can reach us at our support email as well. And um, please look for further communication just regarding when that recording is available. So thank you again so much, um, parents and educators and priests and clergy and everyone that was here tonight. We are so grateful um, and we wish you all a good night. God bless. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.